afternoon, and welcome to this year's Founders Day Address. My name is Emily Shea, and I'm a member of the class of 2014. Celebrating the legacy of the Sisters of Notre Dame is not a new experience for me. Before coming to Emmanuel, I attended East Catholic High School in Manchester, Connecticut, a school that was also founded by the Sisters. After spending four years at a high school that was dedicated to the mission of the SNDs, I knew I wanted to continue in this academic tradition for my college career. I entered Emmanuel with the comprehensive foundation and knowledge of what the Sisters' mission is all about. At countless school gatherings and assemblies, we heard the well-known phrase of St. Julie Billiard, how good is the good God? For me, attending a school in the tradition of the Sisters of Notre Dame means being in a place that values open expression of the goodness of God each day through my words, service, and actions towards others. This is something I experienced throughout my years of high school and something I immediately recognized as an integral part of the Emmanuel spirit. Nearly the entire Emmanuel community participates in community service at some point during their college careers. It could be anything from participating in the fall day of service, helping out in a classroom at Mission Grammar School, going on an alternative spring break trip, or working at a Habitat for Humanity build. There are countless opportunities for all members of the community to get involved and make a difference, and this was evident as soon as I arrived last year as a freshman. For me, the values of the sisters have influenced my decision to become a sociology major with a human services concentration. Their strong emphasis on academics has encouraged me to enroll in the honors program, continuing to challenge myself. I am continuing my commitment to service through participation in Alternative Spring Break 2012 in Phoenix, Arizona. Finally, I've been selected to be part of the 1804 Society, a new organization on campus that strives to better educate the student body about the college's founding order. I am proud to continue my education at an institution that is built upon, celebrates, and so clearly lives out the extraordinary values of the Sisters of Notre Dame. I ask you, on this Founders Day, to reflect on your individual Emmanuel experience as students, faculty, and staff, and ask yourself, how am I contributing to and living out the mission of the Sisters? What gifts can I share that will further the mission of the Sisters and of Emmanuel? How am I going to personally continue their commitment to education and to social justice? At this time, I would like to invite Carolyn Caveney up to deliver the invocation. Wow. That's great in there. Thank you, Emily. Let us take a moment to be aware of God's presence. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for allowing us to come together one more time. We thank you that we have the opportunity to celebrate Founders Day and once again recognize the beginning of the legacy of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur. We thank you for their dedication. Since 1804, the sisters have embraced the expectation of their founder, St. Julie Billiard, be attentive to the urgent and emerging needs among the people you serve. We thank you for their self-determination, persistence, and resilience. For close to 100 years, their exceptional service, vocation to teaching, creative endeavors, thoughtful planning, responsible stewardship, and vibrant vision have shaped and continue to shape Emmanuel College. We thank you for their collaboration, and we appreciate and accept their invitation to be contributing members of this community of educators guided by the words of St. Julie, teach whatever is necessary to equip students for life. So in this moment, 
let each of us in the quiet of our heart offer our own thank you for these blessings and those that continue to shower us each day. And let those gathered here say, Amen. I am pleased to introduce the president of Emanuel College, Sister Janet Eisner, SND. Thanks to Sister Janet's dynamic leadership over the past three decades, Emanuel today is providing an outstanding liberal arts and sciences education to record number of students. Sister Janet is a graduate of Emanuel, holds a master's degree from Boston College, and a PhD from the University of Michigan. She has also received many honors and awards in recognition of her achievements. Sister Janet. Thank you so much. This Founders Day has been, this Founders Week has been a grand celebration and I think the best that we've ever had and each year we seem to get more people involved and pre prepare more programs. So thank you to all those who have worked on it, especially Mark over there, Mark Harrington and all the students from the 1804 Society and others who have participated as well as campus ministry. I am just beyond, over the top, in terms of what, what's been happening. So it's a very special day. It's a very special joy to, to be with you today on our 20th Founders Day. And this is also, as you know, uh, part of our mission-based planning initiative as we come to understand more of the founding vision that informs our own mission. So the founding vision of the Sisters of Notre Dame speaks, as does the mission of Emmanuel College, in a compelling way to our time today. And we're beginning with the sunflower. But the, whoops, <laughs> but the cover goes back to the 200th anniversary celebration. That's what Emmanuel did in 2004 as a celebration of the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Sisters of Notre Dame. Now, St. Julie loved the sunflower. She saw them all over France. And her famous words, which many of you have heard before, as the sunflower follows all the movement of the sun and ever turns toward it, so our minds and heart turn ever to, the God, to God. St. Julie Billiard, taking this from statements in our constitutions, the Sisters of Notre Dame, filled with love for God and God's people, commits her life, committed her life completely to God to spread the gospel everywhere especially the gospel, that she believed that God is indeed good. Her joy and deep-rooted trust in God made strong in years of contemplative prayer, of physical pain, and of persecution, attracted others, Francis Bland de Bourdon to begin with, and others to follow Jesus according to the spirit and wisdom of Julie. The Sisters of Notre Dame aim to express in our time, as Julie did in hers, that God is good. We search anew in each time and place for ways to spread the gospel and to take our stand with the poor. We value the focus on education in our tradition and give special attention to the educational dimension of our mission. That's from the Constitution. Now, briefly, Julie Billiard, born in 1751, the daughter of a shopkeeper in Couvali, France. She saw her family robbed her father shot, and she herself became paralyzed at the age of 22. During the time of her illness, when she lived in Compiègne and in Amiens, Julie learned to trust in the good God and exclaimed often, how good is the good God? Frances Bland de Bourdon was a member of the French aristocracy, and she was drawn to Julie, and both women witnessed firsthand the French Revolution and the resulting lack of education, especially education in the faith, especially of young people. Two women from very different backgrounds, their relationship rooted in the love of God and 
were the people who brought about the founding of the Sisters of Notre Dame. These are pictures of Couvelie, of Julie's home in northern France. And the next one is as well. That's a picture of the garden and the church there. Julie and, and Francis shared a passion for education. So in 1804, they made vows to God to devote themselves to the education of youth and to go wherever they were needed to instruct the poor free of charge and they had the courage to form a new congregation of women religious. They attracted many young women to join them from two distinct cultures, the French and the Flemish, and they were very, very different. The next slides are of Amiens, where Julie and Francis really began. Julie believed that God was calling her to form a religious congregation which would go all over the word, world, would be apostolic and mobile, not monastic, in other words, not staying in one place. The Bishop of Amiens had other ideas, and he believed that she needed to stay in Amiens. Now, what you have here is the picture, the, the further one is the picture of the beautiful, magnificent cathedral of Notre Dame in Amiens, and that picture is the picture of Le Beaudieu that she was so fond of and which she saw so often during her days in Amiens. The other is the garden of the bishop, and I'll tell you about that now. So powerful was Julie's experience of God's call that, that she had the courage, this is 1804, to withstand the raging criticism of the bishop. And that's the not, not the first time that she experienced it or that others have experienced it. Julie and Francois, after this experience, made the most difficult of all decisions, and that was to leave their country of origin, the country of birth, become expatriates, and to accept the invitation of the Bishop of Namur and move to Belgium in order to carry out their mission. Now this here is a picture of um, Francis Bland de Bourdon, and what you see across from that is the Hotel Bland de Bourdon, which is still there in Amiens today. And that is where Julie and Francis spent, spent some of their time. So they make this decision to leave Amiens to go to Belgium and because the bishop insisted that they stay. So from the very beginning, Julie and Francis had to train the young women who would come to them to be teachers in the schools. Wherever she and Francis went, they opened boarding schools and always free schools for the poor. Julie undertook journeys, uh, over 120 of them in 12 years, some of them at a 750 mile stretch, even though she had to travel by foot, by stagecoach, in very difficult times, and I'll comment on that. But first I want to talk about their move to Namur. The picture on one side is the picture of the first house in Namur. And the next picture down below is a picture you see Sister Anne with two of the Belgian sisters, and that's in the garden outside of that. This rock here was given to me by uh, Sister Ellen Guilty on the occasion of my 20th anniversary uh, she, I don't know, she managed to take it from the garden in Namur <laughs> and bring it here. I didn't take it. <laughs> and, and the plaque reads, um, the great to, to, to me at Emanuel College, continuing the greatest work on earth. All right, this next picture is really the picture of the mother house in Namur, which Julie founded. And this is, it's, it's about the size of a half a city block. It's totally enclosed. It's a school itself. And the the picture that's furthest over is the picture of the garden chapel. Can you hear me all right? Well, it's working great. Um, and it's in that chapel, we'll go into the chapel, Megan, um, that you have the, a number of plaques um, from people all over the world to Julie Billiard, as well as the insignia, which you see at the college here as well, Achille Bon, Le Bon Dieu. And the next slide, two slides that are very specific to Emmanuel. The first one, this is a copy of it, was put there by um, our alums back in 1930. And it said, Blessed Mayor Julie, protect and increase Emanuel College Boston, USA. Well, that has happened. And in 1935, <laughs> that was certainly a prayer. The other slide is, says on it, you can't see it as well, and it says, with gratitude for bringing Julie Hall home to Emmanuel College, Nicole de la Va Hines, Thomas Hines, October 12, 2003. And for the students who 
um, for whom this is new, Julie Hall was the first residence hall built at Emanuel, named for St. Julie, obviously, in 1958 it was built. And in 1974, we sold that building to Beth Israel Hospital. It was known as the Libby Building until around 2002, when the students, our enrollment began to increase significantly. And um, it looked as though we had very, very little chance of ever getting Julie Hall back to Emanuel College. In fact, the chance was about this much. But with, I'm sure, a lot of help from St. Julie and from Nicole de Lava, who was a student, was a student at Namur. And in fact, the pictures of, with Sister Ann and with me earlier, those are, those are her teachers when she was there. And her husband is one of the best real estate people in Boston, now the chair of our board. We were able, against all kinds of odds, just think of how much building has happened out here. Everyone wanted that land, and we wanted it more. Um, but we didn't have the money <laughs> that everyone else had, and that came home. So we thought a plaque in Namur was very appropriate to celebrate the return to a manual of, of Julie Hall. So that's the story, especially for some of you who weren't here in 2002 when that happened. Is there another slide here, Meg? All right, this one is taking us up to Ghent, which was another, op um, that's in the north, in, in the Flemish section of Belgium, and that particular edifice was opened in 1806, and that is truly the size of an enormous city block, and it is still, these, these um, institutions are still running, very healthy institutions, lots of students going to them, and that's again the plaque there with a member of the um, North Belgian province, Sister Gabby. So, now let's, that's just to give you a picture of Namua a little bit, and this is the house, the first house um, that the sisters went to in Namua. But I think it's important to just pause a little bit and look at what was going on. Julie was totally undaunted in carrying out this mission. But let's just take a pause. Some of you really love history, so I won't get into this a lot. But in order to understand what's going on, we need to look at what was going on in the environment. So just imagine what it was like, as I'm talking about this, to open houses all over Belgium. She already had several in France. During, during this time. First of all, the French Revolution, 1789. At that point, a few months after it began, the first, one of the first things that happened was all religious orders were suppressed and no one was allowed to take vows. Priests were persecuted. Um, Julie was a number, one of the numbers of people that were hiding priests to survive that part of the revolution. Robespierre became a dictator. He executed thousands and thousands of people, the members of the aristocracy, religious like the Carmelites in, in Paris, and many, many poor people, and he declared himself the supreme being. And Francis Bland de Bourdon, who was a member of the French aristocracy, was in prison with her entire family, ready to be guillotined. They were doing guillotining in, in bundles of 50 and 60 people at a time, all over, all over France. Robespierre fell, I think it was two days before she was scheduled to go through the guillotine. That's, that's in 1794. In 1804, 1804 society, you're celebrating February 2nd, but in May, Napoleon was consecrated emperor. He had been, France was at war with most of Europe, and so Napoleon was spent most of this time marching his troops through France, Belgium, and around. 1815 was particularly concerning because by then there were a number of of houses and schools and boarding schools that the sisters ran. And in 1815, what happened to all you history majors? A, uh, 1815, Battle of Waterloo. And Napoleon is defeated. Where is Waterloo? 20 miles outside of Brussels. So there are 25,000 French troops who are hungry, tired, and so they come through these towns, open, going into the schools, going into the houses, and Julie, at one point, talks about how she had to put up extra bars um, because after the French came the Prussians who chased the French back into France. So just imagine running schools with children, keeping the community moving, keeping the mission going on under those circumstances. And that didn't end there. Um, if you think of, think of this area in World War II, World War I, um, Flanders Field, uh, where the Flemish are, um, Certainly, that was certainly a, a horrible experience. And these people, these sisters, these students, these schools, 
They experienced this. World War II, 1940, the Germans bombed the mother house in Namur. And I know I mentioned Compiègne. My dad fought in World War II, and it was his regiment that was in Compiègne. The Americans were in Compiègne and in Namur as they were coming across to try to bring closure to the war that was going on. Bastogne is another house in, um, near the Ardennes, and in that community, the basement, one third of the basement was the sisters with the boarders and the students. The other third was with the wounded Germans, and the middle were with the American soldiers. So this area is just um, ripe from, from the Napoleonic days right through. All right, enough history, but I just want you to know there's a lot more to look at. We're just doing some highlights here, so to speak. So Julie recognized the importance of the task that she and Frances were undertaking, so she told Frances to write the annals of events, and Frances did it very carefully. Today, we have copies of all the letters, 484 letters that Julie wrote during that time. This is the clean version. This is my version of um, Julie's letters. And then also, the memoirs of Francis Bland are really the story of the early days. So in these letters, we really have a chance to talk about who the people are, so we can tell the story of them in their own words. As we noted, Julie was paralyzed for 22 years. Excuse me, she was cured miraculously in June of 1804, and she began her public ministry at the age of 53. Julie is seen, 53. She's seen as a vigorous and dynamic woman with remarkable gifts of mind and heart, vivacious French temperament. She was quick and lively, brisk and manner. She laughed often, and people loved to be with her. And the letters are filled with that and the stories that go with them. Much of her time was spent informing the young sisters. Now, you know how old the young sisters were? They were probably in age from 16 to about 21. And remember, they had not been educated. During the French Revolution, schools were practically not existent. So she not only had to, had to form them in terms of religious life, she had to educate them first. And it's interesting, she was a great judge of character and personality. Um, she said to one of the young sisters, make up your own mind this time. Better mistakes than paralysis. Indication of where her head was. Julie's principles of education can be found in her letters and her conferences, and there are numerous ones. She urged her sisters, the teachers, to act and do everything with great liberty of spirit, to teach children to act with liberty of the children of God. And she instructed children in the basics of arithmetic, grammar, spelling, and writing. And she wasn't so high on the mania that she called embroidery. She urged the teachers to be gentle but firm with the children, and please don't be dull as ditch water, she told them. She said over and over, we exist only for the poor, absolutely only for the poor. She loved the children, showed great affection to them, give them my love, and above all, teach them whatever the children need to equip them for life. Julie's simplicity, spirituality, was an apostolic spirituality. Um, she spoke of contemplation and action, or what she called rapture of action, where there is deep unity with God and with the ministry. To Frances Bland, in 1795, she wrote, you will often be able to read in this great book of nature, but only those who can, can find it, who have the joy of seeing God in all things. The spirit of Notre Dame, she writes, is the spirit of intimate conversation with God. She writes, I am all yours while running about everything. Ask for me to find God while I run. One of my favorite accounts from these letters comes toward the end in 1815, five months, she dies in 1816, and she writes, she's being barraged to open new houses, to open more schools, and she's looking at who the teachers are, you know, where's her bench power, and she's looking at her teachers, and she says, I need to prepare them more, they're not really ready for us to open more schools, and I can almost hear her saying this, she says, trust in the good God, it is his work, that is the only prayer I can say, my God, it is your work. With this, I pass through all difficulties. So in my own experience, 
um, I found a lot of consolation in that because I also breathe. My God, it is your work. But what amazing work it is that you and I are engaged in and what Julie called the greatest work on earth. Now, I know I'm going fast, but we got to get to this, the co-founder, Frances Bland de Bourdon. Um, she's the co-founder of the Sisters of Notre Dame. She describes herself when she writes about herself and Julie as the temporal founder of the order and Julie as the spiritual founder. But I think there was really great complementarity and mutuality in their relationship. Frances managed the finances of the early foundations. She writes that it was her income plus the donations of ladies in the area who believed in the work of the sisters, which had to provide in the very first year for over 30 new sisters. She noted that Julie also had a good, good gift for management, saying um, that so that while we lived poorly, we were thrifty and never in debt. Never in debt. Julie wrote often about the financial needs of her new sisters, her new houses, and insisted on the spirit of sharing resources. She wrote, tell me whether you need any money. If we only had two sous, we would share them so that each one would have what was needed. That's our spirit. The boarding schools as well were linked closely with the free schools for the poor so that the financial resources for the free schools for the poor were provided not only by, because the income of Francis Bland didn't last a long, long time, but it was provided by the structure of the boarding schools which supported the free schools which always had to be there, along with lots of hard work by the sisters. That spirit, just parenthetically, but part of our mission, that spirit of sharing resources continues throughout our history. And in recent history, you all know Sister Anne is the treasurer of Emmanuel, but what you may not know is that in the 1980s and 90s, she was the international treasurer and spent most of her energy during those, those years working with the sisters in the United States, in Europe, and in Japan to release resources so that the African and Latin American units would continue and would flourish. She established the Jubilee Fund to see that one part of the congregation continued to provide for the other. So sharing of resources, not just in the founding, but continuing today. It was 1838 that Frances Bland, Mother St. Joseph, died. And at that time, there were 350 sisters, 50 novices, and 15 houses in Belgium. The schools that they opened were noted for excellent education in both the free and the boarding schools. Now, the co-founder, Frances Frances was known as Mother St. Joseph, so you'll look at material that says Mother St. Joseph. And by the way, Julie's name uh, in religion was Sister Ignatius, but she couldn't sign her letters Sister Ignatius until 1814 after the suppression of the Jesuits was lifted in France. The, it was the third superior general of the Sisters of Notre Dame, Sir Ignace Gothos from the Flemish section, inspired personally by Julie, whom she met as a child, who prepared, who pledged when she was very young to go to America. So in 1840, six sisters of Notre Dame set sail from Antwerp, Belgium to cross the Atlantic to America to carry out the mission of the sisters of Notre Dame. And that's the first place they went. Interesting, they didn't cross the channel to England right away. They didn't go to any other part of Europe. They crossed the Atlantic <laughs> to come to America. And they go first to Cincinnati and then from Cincinnati, they come to Boston in 1849. And they came in response to the invitation of Father McElroy, SJ, and they went to St. Mary's in the North End. They opened schools immediately, and at the same time, that particular time, they ran the only Catholic school in the city of Boston. There had been others that had been forced to close, so they were running the only school, and then they kept on going. Uh, they opened, do you recognize McElroy, any of you? What do you recognize? McElroy, you got it. Good. <laughs> and so they opened the academy at Lancaster Street in the North End, then Berkeley Street. That's like diagonally across from the old John Hancock 
Um, they had it there. They went to Cambridge. And then all the mill towns, Lynn, Lowell, Lawrence, Chicopee, Springfield, one right after the other, they opened schools. And they also, in places like Lawrence, they took care of the children during the day and taught the 16 and 15-year-old girls at night so that they were educated. They were working in the mills. Whenever you hear bread and roses, they were right there dealing with uh, the new people. They opened lending libraries in the North End as well as schools. So the mission grew enormously in this part of the country, in Massachusetts and um, particularly. The mission continues, and I know that part, there's so much more here. This is another whole talk, what happens when they cross the Atlantic, and we can do that. Lots of great stories there. Actually, their first move to Boston was quite hilarious, how they arrived. And uh, students about, oh, 15 years or so ago wrote a play about it. And it was very humorous, um, what it looked like when they came for the first time to, to Boston. But this mission continues. And as part of your Founders Week, you've seen the story of Sister Dorothy Stang, who was murdered in 2005 for, for protecting the people who lived in the rainforest in Brazil. And before that, there have been a number of sisters murdered for carrying out the mission, certainly in almost each one of the African countries as they tried to uh, preach the gospel as she was doing in Brazil. Julie's vision to go all over the world is certainly realized with Sisters of Notre Dame, as you know, on all five continents. And I'm going to ask Sister Susan to say a word or two about um, the growth in the mission. Is Sister Isabel here? I can't see. I just have a, just a few things. Um, if that's really a map, it's Sister Karen's map of where we are all over the world. And it's good to look at because I think it's important to see where, where we've gone. Um, I've never been anywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm here. But, but I say that one of the last things my parents said to me when I entered at 17 was, be sure you know what you're volunteering for and don't go out of state. <laughs> so I felt that was good information. But I have great respect for our missionaries who have left um, real, primarily the United States recently. But, but going back, the sisters that Sister Janet re referenced who went to Africa and have set up we were in Africa at the end of the 1800s doing some wonderful kinds of things. So I wanted to just talk about what's happening there now. If we could just have the next slide. Thank you. This is a list. This is the Democratic Republic of Congo. And these are the schools that we have in Congo today, right now. And I think if, if any of us are older, we remember there, there were uh, Catholic schools on every corner when I was growing up, and you, you didn't have to go very far to be into the next parish and the next school. We've also seen many of those close, and when you look around at Emmanuel and you say, well, there you know, don't seem to be too many people walking around with the Notre Dame cross, we're, we're other places doing some really interesting things. Each of these schools can have between 1,000 and 2,000 children. And lists don't do anything for me, so let's have the next. OK. This, the pictures we get from Africa, I, I taught 35 students my very first year um, teaching a sixth grade. And I had a lot of trouble with them. Um, there may be 50 or 60 children in a classroom. And they sit, and their little hands are here, and they just look. And they don't have necessarily all the books, everything that they would need if they were in, uh, you know, in a very, very um, affluent country. But they are learning, and we are teaching them. And those students are going on to high school. Some of those um, schools were high schools that I re um, were on the last slide, and so, and many of them are going to college. So you can see that there's the Notre Dame. It's it's not it's not a great building, but it's got the Notre Dame cross on it. And I want one in the corner. It says um, I think it says the power of the sun. And I would love at some point to have us know more about that. That's a photovoltaic project the Sisters of Notre Dame have begun in um, many of the African countries. Because what it does is it takes the power of the sun, transforms it into electricity so that we can run the um, 
power in the schools, computers. And that's making a huge difference in the educational pieces that we're working with in Africa. And then just one last one. These are our young African sisters. And the first time, Sister Anne Mary showed a slide years ago, and it was a picture of um, a lot of our African uh, novices, that's the youngest sisters, uh, just as they were making vows, and they were just getting the cross. And I looked up, and they all had African um, you know, dress on, and I thought, it's the first time I've seen it. I, was, I, it, it, I still remember, because it was in this, in this room where it happened. So if you look, those are all SNDs. They don't look like me, but they're doing the mission of Julie today the same way I try. And when I get up in the morning and if I really am good and can think about it, I know that all over the world there are SNDs getting up and doing the mission, working the best they can. Um, I will say that that group with the green, the, those are postulants. They're the very um, first stage of becoming a sister of Notre Dame. Now, when I entered, the outfit they gave me, <laughs> Did, I must have missed the good brochure on this, this because I, it looked nothing like that. It was long and black. And then the, the sisters on the, on the left are novices. Again, nothing like Sister Anne, Sister Janet, or myself look like. But it gives you an idea of how we get to be part of the culture. The cross is still there. There's still SNDs. Thank you, Sister. So whose mission is it now? Oh, it's, it's all of yours. It belongs to each of you. And I love the card that was given Hope as part of Founders Week. How good is the good God? Why can't we proclaim it to the whole world? And with that, I bring this part of the program to a close. So thank you. I hope you going. word, as it should, goes to a student, Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Excellent. Thank you, Sister Janet, very much for those words. Uh, my name is Jordan Coulomb, as Sister Janet said, and I have the pleasure of currently serving as the Emanuel College Student Government Association President. Uh, today we're here to celebrate the Sisters of Notre Dame, uh, who through their vision, dedication, and faith have established and maintained this wonderful institution of learning for nearly a century, which is pretty remarkable in of itself. I'm truly grateful for my personal Emanuel experience, and no, I'm not just saying that because I'm surrounded by the administration, faculty, and staff of Emanuel. Um, although, Sister Janet, if you would like to give my GPA a little boost, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> I say that because when I look at my personal growth and maturation, the way that I've changed over the past four years, I can trace it directly to the mission of the sisters. When I think about the sisters of Notre Dame, I think there are three concepts that come to mind. The first is a dedication to charity, a dedication to service, and particularly towards the impoverished and needy. The second would be a focus on community and the joy that can, love, can come excuse me, from sharing love and compassion with others. And finally, a commitment to education as a means to promote equality and justice. From my first day at Emanuel, I've encountered these themes on a regular basis. I can still remember when, as a freshman, uh, during our welcome week of orientation, they have the freshmen take part in the new student day of service. This is something that every student who comes into Emanuel is going to be getting involved in from day one. And that, for me, sort of started um, to, I guess, show me how important service can be. As my journey through Emanuel progressed, I began to see the other ways you can get involved through the various clubs and organizations which I took part in. I think the most important experience that I had would be my involvement in the alternative spring break trips. I was fortunate enough to go to Wheeling, West Virginia in Eagle Butte, South Dakota, and those two trips opened my eyes in a way that I never thought possible. I was able to see suffering and need in a way that I couldn't even begin to comprehend. Uh, and at times it's very difficult as someone who comes from the background and position I had to be able to see that, to be able to understand that, to be able to experience that. But what I also saw there was very uplifting. I was able to see the power that hope, love, and compassion could have and see that just one individual really can make a difference. One individual can make a change for these people. 
This is a lesson that I've took with me and I'm going to carry with me throughout the rest of my life. Emmanuel has also shown me the power of community. And I know that we hear this phrase very frequently, but Emmanuel, I believe, truly is a place where people hold doors for each other. It's a place where you respect the other members of this community. It's a place where you appreciate the other members of this community. And it, it, it's a place where you learn what community is. Um, I felt like I'm a part of something when I'm here, and I believe that everyone in this room can attest to that. Everyone in this room feels as though they're a part of that wider Emmanuel family. I think a good story, a good anecdotal story for this is that when I was applying to colleges, um, I was really had my mindset on going to a big school. You know, I wanted to be going to major sporting events where you have 40,000 people. And uh, I was talking to my dad about it, and as fathers so frequently do, he decided to impart some of his wisdom on me. And he said, you know, Jordan, you can go to these big schools, but you need to understand that if you do, you're going to be student number 6,170. If you go to a school like Emmanuel, you will be Jordan Coulomb. And that really stuck with me. And finally, by the age of 18, I was also smart enough to realize that maybe I should listen to my parents once in a while as well. Um, and obviously, he was right, and I ended up at Emmanuel. Um, I think Emmanuel is almost like the cheers of colleges, if you will, because it's a place where everyone knows your name. <laughs> but more than that, Emmanuel is a place where your mentors, where the faculty uh, are more than just that, where the staff are your friends, where you make connections and friendships that are going to last a lifetime and that you'll carry with you. Um, I'm poised to graduate in May, which I sort of have mixed feelings about, uh, but I know that the connections I've made here, that the friendships I've formed, I'm going to maintain. I'm going to stay in touch with people. I'm going to continue to contact people and let them know what I'm doing, how I'm progressing, because that's part of what the Emanuel experience is. It's not something that you're done with after the four years here. It's something that you carry with you. Um, and I think that that's sort of allowed me to grow. It's allowed me to change as an individual because of that support I've gotten, because I always know that I'll have people behind me to support me. And I think that idea of mutual support, that idea of everyone relying on everyone, is indicative of the mission of the sisters. It's a reliance on the whole being bigger than the individual. Um, and when we take that into mind, we can truly grow as an institution. Finally, and perhaps most importantly to me, has been the sisters' commitment to education. Uh, this belief is truly sacred to me as I've been raised around education. My mom was a kindergarten teacher for the better part of 25 years, and now I'm looking to become an educator. Uh, the running joke in the family is that I'm looking to take over the family business, um, although it's probably not in the way that my parents would have expected. But at Emmanuel, I've been able to learn that education is an extremely powerful tool. It's a tool to empower those who have faced adversity. It's a tool to combat poverty, a tool to spread love and compassion. Education is a transformative force, one which has the power to uphold our American values and to provide an equal playing field for all. And it's not just the idea of providing education. It's the idea of the type of education that you provide. It's how you teach people to think, how you teach people to learn. And I think Emmanuel is a testament to that. I can see the Catholic intellectual tradition well and alive at Emmanuel. Learning is a communal experience where everyone's differing opinions are expected to be brought forth, where they're respected, where they're appreciated, where they're encouraged and discussed. It's, a, it's growth through the knowledge of other people. I learn as much from my peers as I do from my faculty, and I think that's a testament to how the faculty teach us, because we encourage those different ideas, because we encourage those differing viewpoints. And that's a very much um, an idea that's in line with the Catholic intellectual tradition. Yes, I've been taught to think rationally and intellectually at Emmanuel. Yes, I've been taught to think analytically. But beyond that, it's been tempered by a moral and ethical awareness. You don't see things in black and white. You think about the wider repercussions. It's a very pragmatic way of thinking. You see the big picture. You're able to think deeply at a level that I don't necessarily know um, is there without that. And I think that this is a quality that's extremely important. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a quality which is extremely important, especially when we consider that we're in an ever-changing world where sometimes it can be more difficult to tell the differences between right and wrong. At Emmanuel, I've seen firsthand what the concepts of social justice and social awareness mean. I've discovered how to approach problems with an open mind while owning my critical thinking and analytical skills. I now understand acceptance, love, compassion, community, and service on a level which I never could have before. With this in mind, I can honestly claim that Emmanuel has provided me with an education not simply focused on internalizing and repeating information, but rather on cultivating me as an individual, as a confident and conscientious intellectual, poised to make a positive impact on this world. 
When I look at my Emmanuel experience, I see the mission of the Sisters of Notre Dame and the, the vision of St. Julie still permeates this campus, still permeates these walls. And it begins to go beyond that because the students and the faculty and the staff who leave Emmanuel take that mission with them wherever they go. It's truly a remarkable way of spreading these ideas, of spreading this mission and taking it one step further. And I think today when we celebrate this legacy, we're not only celebrating the past, but we're celebrating all of us, the people who embody this legacy today, the people who live this legacy, the people who continue to keep the dreams um, and the visions of St. Julie and the sisters alive. I think that we celebrate the faculty and the rigorous curriculum who teach us to think conscientiously and morally. We thank the staff and administration whose constant support and guidance teach us the value of community and dedication. And we thank all those other members of the Emanuel community, be they alumni, students, trustees, or anyone else who's taking that mission, anybody else who's been touched by their Emanuel experience and is carrying that with them. And finally, and most importantly, we thank the sisters themselves, whose diligent leadership and understanding have allowed Emanuel to be able to change with our ever-changing world. The world that the sisters encountered when they founded Emanuel is very different from the world we live in today. And the school has changed. But while it's changed, those core values, those core ideals have remained the same. And that's what allows Emanuel to continue to be the institution that it is today. I would like to close by saying that, as many of you know, we frequently reference the fact that Emanuel translates into our God with us. Um, I think it's very fitting. It's something that we celebrate, something that's very important to us. In light of Founders Week, I want to amend that slightly. Our God is with us, but in addition to that, St. Julie is with us, and the sisters are with us as well, through the mission and through the way that we act on a daily basis. And if we continue to hold onto that mission and onto those values, they always will be. Thank you. And a final word and blessing. One of my first assignments as a Jesuit, and I was not yet ordained, I was still a student, was to St. Mary's Church in the north end of Boston. And <laughs> there was the um, Sisters of Notre Dame who were running the parish school at St. Mary's. Now, St. Mary's was the foundation of the Sisters of Notre Dame in Boston area, and it was also the foundation house of the Jesuits. From St. Mary's grew Boston College, Boston College High School, and a number of other Jesuit um, apostolates around the city and the state. And during my time there, it was unfortunate. Um, we realized that the church and the school would no longer be feasible and that we would have to close. And I, for one, did everything in my power to try and keep the church and school open. And I can remember writing letters to the provincial, the Jesuit provincial, and the provincial at the time of the Sisters of Notre Dame, saying we have to get together to keep this going. It's, it's historically significant. Ultimately, however, we had to close the school and the church and move on. And today there is, in place of the school and church, there's a housing for the elderly in the North End on Cooper Street. When that happened, I can remember talking to the superior of um, the Sisters of Notre Dame. Her name was Alice. I forget her last name. And she, I, I was saying, you know, this is really a shame. It, it's the end. And she looked at me and she said, it's not the end. It's, it's sad that we have to close. She said, but this is just a change. It's a step. We'll go on to other things. There's more to do. There's more out in the future. So don't be sad. And certainly that spirit in a sense, has stayed with me all my life. And as I've gone through my own changes in different apostolates, thinking maybe this might be the end of something, it's not the end. It's a step. All of us in this room are in step with the Sisters of Notre Dame in different ways. All of us are in the footsteps of Julie in different ways. All of us are maintaining not only an academic tradition, a strong academic tradition of excellence, but a spiritual tradition of knowing there is a future. And I think that is crucial, because our future certainly is in the hands of God. But as Thomas Aquinas said, work as though everything depends on you, and pray as though everything depends on God. And certainly, we bring that spirit to us and to what we do. 
So let me close with that blessing for the future. May God take us into the future. May God walk with us, and may God continue to inspire us through the intercession of Julie and through the intercession of the many men and women who have been taught by the Sisters of Notre Dame and carry that spirit with them. Amen. Amen. <laughs>